Okay, welcome back. I'm gonna wait for everybody to come back. I know, sorry they're only an hour long. Um, Instagram splits it up like that. Did my best to fit as much as I could in in an hour. My throat already hurts from talking. Mark's grabbing us some beers and looks like we already got a hundred people back, so. Yeah, in a second we'll continue with any questions or demonstrations you guys would like to see. Yep. Good climb, Nate. Cheers. Cheers. We're back at the, where are we? At the pizza deck in Yosemite. We find Astro Man in five hours. It was amazing. Okay, and so one thing we'll do too is we'll do sort of an after action report. We'll say, okay, you know, on this pitch, I did this, and you said that, and so that happened. How can we not do that next time? You know, uh, some of these techniques, you know, Jordan and I have developed them, but he's a little bit quicker on the uptake than I am. So sometimes he'll go, okay, Mark, you did this, and you could have done that. It would have been easier. Um, which, you know, no ego. I'm ready, I, I'm ready to learn. You know, this whole climbing thing, you know, like I said, I've been doing it for 48 years and I'm still learning stuff. Yes, good question about layering and clothes. I actually didn't get to talk about that. I'll do that in a second. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to talk about is uh, what you do after the climb. I'm a big, especially because I like to climb multiple days in a row, I'm always thinking ahead. Not necessarily just on the climb or the next pitch, but what am I going to climb tomorrow? What am I climbing in a few days from now? So yes, I'll do that. I'm a I'm a huge I'm a huge uh, organization nerd, and Mark likes to make fun of me about it, but he can't make fun of me but too it, much because it, it makes works, his life it works it works it makes my life easy. It makes his life so much better. So um, unless I'm totally hammered, I just had the biggest, longest, most epic day of climbing of my life, and I don't want to do anything when I get back to the car, but eat food and pass out, I will almost always like reorganize all my gear so that the next time I want to go climb, whether it's the next day or after a rest day or whatever, um, it never takes me too much effort to, to, to repack. Um, and I see a lot of people spending so much time digging through gear in the cars and packing up in the morning or whatever. So just try and, you know, sometimes you're like, man, it's the last thing I want to do, but I'm always happy that I did it now instead of putting it off until... Um, later. Any yeah, thought? so don't procrastinate. I kind of just junk showed all our gear and I'm going to reorganize. So talk to Mark. <laughs> okay. this, this is what we would be doing at the top of the climb anyways. Can you show the, can you carry the camera so I can show him the anchor? Yes. Can okay. All right. Well, he'll do that. Um, you know, like, okay, so I've climbed El Cap 34 times. I've done numerous serious big walls. Um, Mark, I've climbed like a fraction of you what you have in your life, and I've already I've climbed El Cap like half as many times as you. Yeah, I know. You did piddly roots like the nose in a day, and that, you know, that doesn't. I mean, I spent 12 days on El Cap. But aid climbing, I mean, and really, efficiency is Jordan and I look at our rack, we know our racks and that we can look at a piece and pretty much fire in the correct piece first try. I have placed probably 100,000 pieces. Pitons, you know, all that kind of stuff, nuts, cams, all that kind of stuff. It, it, you know, like when I first got back in, my, the start of my third career where I was gonna start ape climbing, I actually went out to one of the cliffs with a whole rack of gear, and I spent all day just placing nuts and placing beaks and placing cliffhangers and stuff, just so I could get a little bit more fluid in, in doing that kind of thing. So really, you know, that's one of the ways, no, no, I need the rope. I know. Okay. That's one of the ways why we're efficient, is because we, we know our rack. That's, that's why we don't have a Frankenstein rack of 13 different cams from 13 different companies with, you know, all the beaners that I've found in my life that are all different, that are all different. We, our gear is all the same. Our beaners, I mean, I sort of laughed at the uh, colored beaners when those came out. But we started putting together that colored beaner system at the end of, at the middle of last season. 
and it is the way to go. Every single thing you don't have to think about increases your efficiency. Everything you know how to do right away increases your efficiency. If, even if I was setting up a, a, a gear anchor, I would set it up quite a bit like what we do here, because it's the same thing. When Jordan got to the anchor, he would recognize it as the same thing. He, I'd have his sling hanging there, he could clip in, I could move the grigri. It's the same thing. That's why we can just, we, we do these things fast. It's just, nothing's, we talk about it, everything's new, everything's, or no, no, nothing's new, everything's the same. Do you wanna? Um, all right, before I get to a, a few questions, um, some things I have on my outline that I didn't get to touch on in the last video um, was the climb itself. So arriving at the base, um, you know, from the planning, um, yes, Sierra Nevada, pale ale. Um, from the planning part of the clinic, you know, we would already know who's leading the first pitch. Um, okay, I'm leading the first pitch, therefore I'm gonna focus on racking up while Mark is going to flake, uh, the ropes, flake out the, the ropes, ready. you know, get the pack ready. Um, so we went over a little bit of transitions, how to speed that up is to, to multitask and basically try and be one step ahead of the program, whether you're belaying or, you know, you're setting up to belay your partner up to you or you're belaying your leader. Okay, I can see Mark's, you know, 10 feet away from the anchor um, and it's on easy terrain. I can, you know, give him out some slack. I can start putting on my shoes. I can take a pee when he's at a rest. You know, I can communicate if, if that's something I need to do. If, if I was around the corner and Jordan couldn't see me, I might yell, hey, 25 feet to the anchor. Yeah. You know. So general rule of thumb is it's always my goal if I'm leading is to get off belay as fast as possible and get my partner moving as fast as possible. And that's a team effort thing. So um, for Mark, um, if he's getting ready to um, follow a pitch, you know, it's our goal to, as soon as I pull up the rope and he says that's him, is for him to start climbing right away. And that doesn't always happen, but, you know, if we're able to hit that time, um, that, saves, that saves a lot of time um, over, the course of, over the course of the day, you know. You don't want to wait for them to pull up and pull up the rope and tell you that you're on belay and then you start breaking down the anchor and then you start putting on your shoes and then you take a snack, you know, that just kills so much time. So, talked about the Grigri versus the ATC. The re main reason I like to belay with the Grigri, um, even um, from above, uh, directly off the anchor, is it saves your elbows a lot more. I find the ATC just has a lot more, um, uh, what do you call it, friction, <laughs> um, and makes my elbows tired after a long day. And it's just freaking safe. Yeah, uh, people say the Grigri's heavy, but it's like you could probably eliminate other dumb things on your yeah. anchor or on your. If, on if your you think rack. a Grigri's safe, you need to shave your beard, and you'll save as much weight. <laughs> you mean too heavy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as well, um, as well, the Grigri. What was I going to say about it? Uh, uh, yeah, if your partner falls and they're hanging on the anchor and they want to lower to try something again. Um, it's way easier to do that on a Grigri than it is uh, with an ATC in guide mode. It just takes a little bit, a little bit more um, shenanigans involved. Uh, and yeah, so we mainly use the ATC for repelling. That's basically it. Or if we drop a device, which has never happened. So um, one thing to think about in planning is swapping leads versus leading in blocks. And do you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh Okay, so so I particularly don't really care for um, clove hitches, and so I don't use them. I mean, I might use them, given that we always, pretty much always swap leads. Although, you know, if there's two very hard pitches in a row and I don't want to lead one, I'll set up the anchor a certain way so that, that Jordan, you know, or Jordan will, well, whatever, we'll set up the anchor so that the leader, the same guy, can continue leading. If not, we'll just do our own little thing. If Jordan wants to use clove hitches on his beaners, great, let him untie them. Um, I'll, I'll, typically I'll go in with a clove hitch just so I can get the right distance that I like. I'll tie the little knot for the grigri, and then I'll tie an eight knot, and I'll just sort of adjust that so it anchors really yeah. nice. Yeah, so he's asking if we can show you that trick now. Yeah, so we're, we're gonna do that, Mark set that up. The main thing um, about 
you know, there can be an advantage to swapping, um, swapping leads, I mean, uh, or leading in blocks. The main thing is just, if you're leading in blocks, it's somewhat easier on the leader to keep them in, you know, mental leading mode. And as well, they lead a pitch, their partner follows, they lead another, versus when you're swapping leads, you know, you follow a pitch and then you have to cast into the lead on the next one with sometimes um, very little rest, which can be difficult if, you know, there's two stacked pitches. So Mark and I, most of the time, um, generally uh, just swap leads, but we're also very flexible and, you know, communicate with each other with, you know, sometimes we get to a pitch that I was supposed to lead and I'm not feeling it or I'm too tired or, you know, Mark decides he's psyched, you know, we're, we're very flexible and willing to, to change on the fly um, if necessary. And when we're building rope anchors, I'm getting to the anchor and, uh, and I know that I'm going to lead the next pitch. So I'll tie an eight knot with a fairly good loop. Okay, so you know, loop like this, clip in, I'm going to tie this eight knot here for the for the uh, for the Grigri, and then I'm going to tie an eight knot there. Notice good size loop. So I blade Jordan up. We've got the sling. He clips in. He's ready to go. He takes his loop. Okay. Yeah. So this is if I was to if you were going to lead the next pitch. Yeah. And so, therefore I need to anchor myself right, in with so the rope. Right. So here's his end. So he's gonna tie an eight knot, and then underneath the anchor, he's gonna thread this loop through that loop, clip it into there, and then he can easily pop my knot on top, okay? He's gonna set up his little knot here. For, well, no, he'll just put this on his harness. So he's gonna tie another eight knot, and then he's going to send that through the loop. See how that's working? And then now I'm on top. I can easily unclip that. I can easily unclip this. Yeah. No real big deal. And it's not always necessary. That is a super helpful technique when you're at a hanging belay and you're not really able to unweight the anchor very easily. If you're on a ledge, though, it's very easy for me to take my own carabiners and clip them yeah. in and, I mean, there's always that. and tie myself in. So options in your arsenal is really is, is a good way to go with this whole efficiency thing. So that's how we do it. Okay. Um, all right, so one more thing I wanted to talk to you guys about before we legitimately start answering more of your questions. Um, uh, okay, too bright, jeez. Um, is is clothing um, clothing is huge um, you know another important piece of gear to to consider when you're you're planning to climb a multi-pitch route and um, I like I don't like to be hot so I don't climb the Sun I also don't like to be cold so I like to have the proper uh, proper um, clothing with me and I am the total weenie about being too hot or too cold I really 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 don't like so Mark, if you could, let's um, talk about some of my layering systems for multi-pitch climbing. Okay, do you wanna? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and yes, yeah, somebody just asked if, it's gonna be available on our story afterwards. Um, I'm also gonna post these to IGTV and YouTube so you can rewatch. Um, yeah, yeah. So, my number one favorite piece of clothing for multi-pitch climbing is any type of thin long sleeve shirt or sun hoodie type thing because I, I typically get really hot when I climb so I don't like to climb with thick layers unless I'm somewhere like the Hulk or you know in the Alpine in the Bugaboos or, or wherever. Um, so for, for fair weather rock climbing, we're based out of California, let's talk Yosemite Valley for example, um, this is like my number one layer because I, it's thin enough where I can climb and not get too warm. Um, uh, and, but then it's also protective of the sun if you're climbing um, you know, in the sun or rappelling at the end of the day. So this is the, the Arcteryx, Arcteryx um, Remige sun hoodie. And the other thing I like about it is that if I don't want to wear it and say we're not hauling a pack, you know, we're carrying everything with us on our harness, is I can twist it up 
very easily and tie it around my waist and hardly notice it in addition to the rest of the gear I'm already carrying. So that I almost bring with me every single time I climb a multi-pitch route in a place like Yosemite, for example. So it doesn't take up much space at all. Yeah. And, and that thing, those are nice. Um, say I was climbing a route like the Freerider in a day, for example, I would bring a hat. Um, this is the Arcteryx um, Alaho cap. It's like a trail running or hiking cap, obviously for protecting you from the sun. But um, this is awesome too, because I can just stuff it in my pocket for when it's not, and you hardly even notice that. Um, so sometimes that's all I would bring. Um, if I'm looking for a little bit more protection, say somewhere like the Hulk, um, I'd like to bring a, a lightweight shell, whether it's for wind protection or light rain protection or, um, or whatever. This is small enough, it packs up in my, on itself and I can uh, wear this on my harness. And basically, you know, unless it's really cold, this sun hoodie and this together um, really can keep you as warm as you need to. And if it's not keeping you as warm as you need to, um, climb faster and warm up, you know? <laughs> Otherwise, if it is legitimately that much colder, um, we'll bring some type of, of puffy. Um, sometimes we'll both have our own. More often than not, we'll bring one that is just for the glare. Um, this is my favorite jacket, the, the Arcteryx Nucleus jacket that just came out. Really light synthetic jacket, so it's good if it gets wet. Um, it looks kind of big, um, but it could really be stuffed down so much further. I hate it when you have to, um, you know, struggle to stuff your jacket in the tiny little stuff sack that it comes with. So this is super easy. Um, it's a little big stuffed up, so you can even put it in a smaller one, but it's light enough. And for the warmth to weight ratio that you get, um, if it's necessary to bring a puffy, um, that's good. So I rarely ever carry this on my harness though. If we're gonna bring a puffy, I'll typically, we'll typically also be hauling hauling a pack. Um, so yeah, those are kind of my, my three favorite layers is a sun hoodie, some type of collapsible hat, um, a windbreaker or rain shell, and then uh, maybe a puffy. And of course I have other layering systems for more specific scenarios, but generally that's it. Um, if there's a long approach, like say up to the base of Half Dome, and you know, you're gonna be getting really sweaty and it's gonna be hot, um, I'll typically bring a pair of shorts for the approach or the descent, depending and sometimes we'll even bring another t-shirt. So if I'm gonna get all sweaty hiking to the top of the, or to the base of a route, I'll you know, have a new shirt to change into to climb the route at the base. That's kind of like princessy type tactics, but you know, if you wanna be comfortable. And then uh, my feet sweat a lot and I hate hiking down in like super sweaty socks. So sometimes I'll bring an extra pair of socks too. But that's basically it. Um, if I'm gonna be climbing in the cold, like somewhere at the Hulk, where I'm not gonna be adding and de-layering um, very frequently, I'm just gonna be climbing consistently in the same layer. Uh, this is the, the Proton FL. This is just like a really light synthetic um, type uh, puffy layer, but it's also really breathable, so it regulates heat really well. So those are kind of like, that's another option. Those are all my favorite for layering. Jordan, of course, is sponsored by Arcteryx, and so he gets all this stuff, and I'm, by extension, sort of like casually sponsored, so I have a lot of this stuff too, and believe me, it really does, it really does inspire some confidence to, you know, to know that you've got good quality clothing and that you can be warm, you can be dry, you can be comfortable, you know, and, and Sometimes this stuff might save your life. So, I mean, yeah. you can buy safety. And believe me, I don't want to freeze to death anywhere. And I hate to be cold. I hate to be wet. So I'm willing to buy safety. Plus, look good, climb good. And then look good, climb good, too. All um, right. Okay. So some Numerous people have talked about helmets, asked about helmets. Okay, sure. We're going to – I'm going to scroll through to the back to, or the okay. beginning to look so we'll at get the questions. Helmets. But, no, we can, we, can answer, okay. we can answer helmets first. I have I have no good reason for me not wearing a helmet. There's no, a lot there's of no the good reason to not wear a helmet. Uh, yeah, I personally just don't like them. Um, I've probably worn a helmet more than you might think. Um, 
particularly if, if it's in the Alpine, if there's a bunch of people above me on a big wall, if I'm at all concerned about, about rock fall, um, if I'm doing a, a heady gear route, you know, where the other, you know, there's big fall potentials, I'll wear a helmet. But um, yeah, you guys could all make it's, the argument that it, I should wear one more. It's often. so easy to fall and hit your head that and helmets once you put them on you hardly even know they're on your head so there's really no good reason um you know of course back in the day helmets weighed a ton and nobody wore them and then helmets got good and people started to wear one and really i used to wear one almost almost all the time yeah i don't now and sometimes i'm conflicted about that i don't you know it's you know it i don't know it's just there's no reason in the world not to wear one. That's just we'll just call you that. We'll just say that. Yeah. So, personal decision at the end of, at the end of the day. There's plenty of really nice lightweight helmets out there nowadays to make it. You know, really no reason not to. Okay. Scrolling through questions. Um, what do you do when you find a piton on your FA? Well, it's probably not an FA <laughs> yeah. unless it's the first first free ascent. Well, but, unless, yeah. unless they bail too. Oh, great question about water. Um, talking about planning and preparation um a lot of that too comes to proper rest nutrition and hydration and you know you're you hydrate days before you actually climb so if you're hydrating the day of or even the day before you're kind of too late yeah. and so um do your best to, to hydrate before uh, especially in in addition to not climbing in the sun um you know which therefore you get hotter and need more water um the more hydrated I am before, I can kind of be like a camel and not need as much water uh, the day of. So I'll typically bring like, um, a, can you grab that? Oh. This is my specially rigged, probably like 0.75 liter Gator, Gatorade bottle. Um, and that's good enough for me. Sometimes I'll bring a, another bladder reservoir to leave in my pack at the base for, for at the end of the climb, if, if that makes sense or Whatever, but yeah, typically if I'm well hydrated, I can and I'm climbing in the shade. This is enough for me for a day. And Mark hardly drinks anything. Yeah, so I could drink. I just have it uh, clove hitched with like three mil uh, cord. I have a little pint bottle that I take that I hardly would drink. Was but also people people use these big things like this. You know, this is a quart. Okay, mm -hmm. so a gallon. This is a quarter of a gallon. This weighs two pounds. So hanging this to your harness, and then this thing swinging back and forth, you know, totally it, sucks. It, it's going to be hard. This to, is also a death bomb on a place like El Cap or another multi-pitch oh, route with people below you, because unless you rig it otherwise, this plastic thing can very easily break, yeah. and then this thing's a missile rocketing down to the base yeah. or anybody That's a below. Two-pound missile. Yeah, that could totally kill somebody. So, okay, so it, was your first big wall scary, Mark? Uh, your first big wall South was a wall, the South wall, 1974. How could it not be somewhat scary? Yeah, I was 18 years old. I had never climbed El Cap. I had never done a route longer than two days. Um, it was pretty wild. Uh, no topos, no three bolt belays, no Yosar. Um, yeah. It was pretty wild. I, but I can't say that I was scared. Yeah. One thing I will say, though, don't climb the whole route on the first pitch. Climb the first pitch, then climb the second pitch, then climb the third pitch. What you do know? you mean Just, by don't well, climb the whole route on the first don't pitch? Don't worry about that 510 pitch, you know, 30 yeah. pitches above. You know, climb your next pitch. Climb the next pitch that you've got to do. Do a good job on this one. Be present, sure. Yeah, be present. Uh, my first big wall was um, Flight of the Albatross on, on El Cap. And that was, ki that was kind of scary because it was like legitimately hard aid climbing and there was, you know, I don't know what you call it, bad gear, I guess, yeah. and big fall potentials and, and whatnot. Um, but Great. no, I wouldn't say it was scary. It was, it was just really exciting. Um, I didn't have a ledge though and I had to sleep on horrible natural ledges and we got rained on. So there was like an element of fear and spiciness but it was all just part of the adventure that i was you know had craved for so long wanting to see now this one's good what's the best way to to give rope signals when you can't hear each other mm -hmm. okay jordan and i know the system we know what's going to happen if i'm down there at the anchor and i'm looking at the rope and i'm going eh, 
It's the topo said 140 feet, and it looks like he's got about 60 feet of rope left. He's been climbing for a while. He should be getting to the anchor. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of rope goes out. Okay, he's probably at the anchor. And then the, the haul line starts flapping and things start dangling. I go, oh, he's hauling, so he's probably off belay. So I take him off belay, I get the haul line, it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, I'm you sort can... of listening, the haul bag goes away, the lead line comes up, the lead line comes tight to the anchor. I go, okay, well, he's, he's probably got me on belay. Yeah. I untie the anchor, the rope goes up, okay, he's got me on belay. I untie, I start climbing. Yeah, so it's kind of using you know, your situational common sense and deductive reasoning and experience with your partner. And, you know, so you can kind of make your, your best judgment call, but if I ever have any, you know, if I don't know exactly if Mark's off belay, I think he is, but I'm not sure and I'm not comfortable to take the device off, I'll just feed it all the way out uh, until I run out of rope. And I'm like, all right, well, he's for sure at the anchor now. Or and even if he's not, maybe I got a simul yeah, climb yeah. five feet or yeah. or whatever. But um, yeah, so the rope signals um, when we can't hear each other that I've always been taught um, that we sometimes try and use is you know uh, syllable poles like off belay, so like three poles. Yeah. Um, and that's that's yeah. what I've always done. Three big poles means you're ready to go. And so whenever whenever a situation like that comes up, where you know, say we we can't hear each other and we're making these decisions, once we do meet back up, we'll kind of be like, "Could you hear me? Like, did I? You know, were you on belay? Like, right. you know, right. see just to kind of figure out if we were making the right calls and if we were on the same page, and you know, that helps us out in the future. Okay, Mark, how did you and Jordan meet? How did you end up being climbing partners, Jenny? I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that. Jenny, Johnny. We uh, we met at Donner Summit, uh, an area that I've climbed at for a million years. Jordan was there. Uh, Max had met Jordan somehow, maybe at Donner. No, I, I had met Max, his old climbing partner at um, <clears throat> at Mesa Rem, and oh, which is a climbing gym in Reno. Yeah. And we had climbed there a bunch. And, and so we we got together and we belayed each other on some roots at Snowshed, and we started talking and. You know, I had sort of known a little bit about Jordan. He knew a little bit about me. And, um, you know, like, I'm an old guy, but I'm sort of psyched to go climbing, and Jordan wants a good partner, so we went off, and I think we, I think our first real-life route was the Hulk of the Day. Yeah, um, yeah that seems like a good answer for now. If you'd like to learn more about how Mark and I met, there's... Plenty of articles that have been written about about us. You can go back into my my Instagram feed and read some more of our stuff. Um, but we also have a movie um, that my friend Sam is making for Arcteryx about us um, that's going to come out this summer. That'll explain a little bit more about our our partnership. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Fletcher Miles asks, "Do you ever consider simul climbing easy terrain?" So me personally, yes. Um, Mark doesn't I, doesn't really like it. I have soloed, you know, in my youth. I've soloed quite difficult things, so I'm sort of I sort of know how to do that. Um, I did the nose in a day years ago, and I and I short fixed the whole freaking thing. But I'm just a little bit more cautious these days in my life. I mean, I'm not. I I, I can sort of do it. I don't mind doing it. I'm sort of learning to not mind doing it. I don't want to be the second guy. I think that's a little bit too much re responsibility for me. So. So I don't, at a certain level, I don't feel too bad doing it given Jordan being the second person. So I, I definitely, excuse me, I definitely consider it more than Mark. Um, but yeah, that's just for whatever reason, he's not, not comfortable with it. And we've tried and it hasn't worked that well at times. So um, I mean, I would simul climb at five, six pitch, wouldn't bother me. I mean, you say, simul, you say simul climb and you think, oh, both people climbing at the same time. That sounds so much faster and easier. But like, go and try it and... It's like a highly advanced skill. It's not easy to do well and to make it work efficiently where, you, you know, you're both, you, you know. And that's so why, that's why. It I mean, does take a lot of experience and practice to, like, get comfortable simul climbing. Yeah, and I mean, Jordan and I have wrapped El Cap four times now, and we've simul, simul wrapped hundreds of pitches, and we are very good at it. But I don't want to sound boastful or anything, but we are experts. Um, it, you know, you do not want to die rock climbing, and really, 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 it's really not that much faster. I mean, if you, I mean, if 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 freaking the 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 bad weather storm of your life, and you're gonna die in this storm is coming, okay, 
do it. But I mean, if you want to get down because the pizza bar is going to close, yeah, that's not a good enough reason. Yeah, there's you know? plenty of arguments. I mean, that, and that's why we don't go into simul climbing. I mean, if you're experts and you can figure it out and you know how to do it safe and you communicate well with your partner, great. Uh, but I, there's really no need for it. Okay, so Ben Sketch, Ben, yeah. Um, sorry, Ben. Um, Just go for the first name. Yeah, yes. Uh, on a gear anchor, do you use a different anchor? Uh, seems like the one you showed would extend pretty far if the first piece fails. So, yeah. Uh, fundamentally, if we're building a gear anchor with a rope, like it's essentially the same um, using either a clove hitch or a figure eight and, um, you know, some kind of master point between the two. Um, so yeah, if I was building a gear anchor, for example, I would equalize two pieces, whether, you know, they're, they happen to e be placed and equalize themselves or one's far farther up and one's lower. And I put a quick draw so that they're equal. I would put a, a, a figure eight into those and then have my third piece, um, I ideally bomber, I would clove hitch into that and put a figure eight between the two. Um, I don't have a way of demonstrating that right now, but. Uh, fundamentally, you're using the same things as you would um, a rope anchor on two bolts. Yeah, it's I mean, if I had some tiny little nut up over in one spot, I would definitely be a little bit more cautious. But if I, if I had three or four tiny little nuts all sort of semi-equalized together to, to, to a single bolt, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, Nick... Brown, uh, what do you guys think of half ropes? Any scenarios in which you might use half ropes rather than the single with the tagline? Um, I've never actually used half ropes. My understanding is that they're more popular in, in ice climbing or alpine terrain, or I know um, much more popular in Europe. And maybe if I was climbing something like that, I would I would consider it. But at least for what for what we do, um, yeah. the the 9-1 Maxim Airliner and the 7-mm um, Maxim Escape Rope uh, works really well. So, um, what is an ATC useful for? Uh, Jack asks. We answered that already, and that is repelling. Um, or belaying in guide mode, if you if you like it for that. Yes, if you're worried about the weight of a Grigri, pick a different route or eliminate something else on your harness to warrant the extra weight. I mean, Grigri. Because Grigri is, like, amazing. Lose so some weight. Many so many ways <laughs> all right we showed um, okay we're getting down if you guys want to send more of your questions mark may have issue this bite I don't know that do uh, prefer, prefer the figure eight to the clove I think you explained that just because it's oh, if it gets, why do you prefer just because I'm a freaking wimp and I don't like to work on to untying these things yeah there's really no other reason so, than, than personal personal preference okay we're scrolling down hey and by the way thank you for all being here this is really cool and yeah like I said we're gonna we're gonna post this to um, our story afterwards for 24 hours but I'll also try and upload it to uh, to YouTube and um, to my IG TV um, this is a this is a full experiment it seems to be going really well thanks for being here um, yeah um, I'm already losing my train. Yeah, we did the helmet. I'm already, I'm this already is sort losing, of getting towards the end. I'm already losing my, my train of thought, but yeah. Um, they were asking uh, the well, material, I mean, actually, for you. Were just the only reason we're doing this is because we're in quarantine, and like I said, I normally teach these kind of clinics a few times, and a lot of my events have, have gotten canceled. And so I'm trying to find a way to give back, and this seems to be working, so we'll probably, uh, we'll probably do something similar. I know I did a, a questionnaire on my on my page asking what you guys wanted first. This was it. Um, we might do one on, on crack climbing, maybe sport climbing, or projecting afterwards. Um, okay. okay, fire some more, more questions. questions. Do you over... Jack Noose asked, do you all oversize your shoes so you can wear socks for very long climbs? So, I... Um, uh, yeah, basically. Um, I have I have two pairs of shoes that I that I basically wear um, for for multi pitch rock climbing um, in my quiver. So for example, the free rider in a day, I brought two pairs of shoes. Um, one pair that I only wore on the two hardest pitches, the Boulder Problem and the Enduro Corner, because it has really technical footwork. And then uh, the rest, 
I wore oversized shoes um, just because it was easier mileage or you know easier pitches and there's a lot of mileage and I didn't want my feet to get that tired and, and I was wearing socks so um, I free climbed in El Cap in socks I think three times now so anybody who says that rock climbing in socks is dumb doesn't know what they're talking about I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily do that at the sport crag but you know whatever and me you know, I have shoes that fit, that are comfortable, that I like, and it, it, at a certain point, if uh, I would bring smaller shoes, but I just, you know, I just, my shoes are comfortable, you know? Yeah, and, and also a big reason for me personally why I like to wear socks multi-pitch rock climbing is because my, my feet sweat obsessively, and um, if I'm wearing my shoes for, for a long pitch or a long route, uh, they very easily sweat through my shoes and my shoes get gross and they don't last as long so um, wearing socks is not only a way to make my shoes tighter for performance ironically um, but also just provide another layer between sweat for the sweat and you know make my shoes last longer so okay Carl Gregory asks you guys aren't too fussed on equalization at bolted anchors do you use the same similar technique with gear anchors so we, uh, we address the we address the gear anchors thing. When it comes to equalization, yeah, I guess you could argue that clove hitch and two bolts and the master point between, um, if that bolt that you're clove hitch into fails, that shock loads the anchor. But, and so if I was worried about that, I would equalize it with maybe two quick draws um, with a figure eight to both of them or um, a double bunny air figure eight to the bolts to equalize okay, the two. So but let's, let's do I'm, one, let's yeah, one other thing. Not, fa not worried about bolts failing most of the time. Okay, so a bolt in good granite is worth 8,000 pounds, okay? Your, none of your gear is worth 8,000 pounds. Nothing you are carrying up on, on any route is worth 8,000 pounds. Unless you weigh 8,000 pounds. So, so a bolt breaks, okay? You've got the rope extension, and then both of you are, you know, let's just say both of you are falling four feet onto a static rope or onto a dynamic rope. Okay, so you've got the knots tightening, you know, you've got your bodies absorbing strength. So you've got 500 pounds falling two feet. How, what is the, just like let your mind wander and try to think about how much weight, how much force 500 pounds falling two feet can generate. It certainly can't generate more than a couple thousand pounds. A couple thousand pounds is eight kilonewtons. Okay, go ahead and look at all your carabiners, and all your carabiners are only worth about 24, 22 to 24 carabine, kilonewtons. So you've generated four, you've generated eight kilonewtons now. So this whole equalization thing, it's like people just really don't understand how strong their gear is yeah. and, and have a real life understanding of the forces that you can really put on. I mean, certainly, do not clip into a Dyneema sling and climb above the anchor and fall. Don't do that. I mean, but also, don't close your eyes while you're driving a car. You know, I mean, just don't do that. It, so it's like, e equalization is more important when you're placing your own gear, not necessarily on bolts, unless the bolts are bad. Yeah. So, I mean, okay. if you're up on the Sea of Dreams on El Cap and you've got, you know, nine pitons and they're all crappy, yeah, equalize the hell out of them. Yeah, also, I don't know if you guys may have seen my the route I climbed in Mexico. Lots of clever equalization necessary there because the anchors all sucked. So, okay, John Yu asks, have you ever, have your glasses ever fallen off during a climb? Uh, yes, only once. Uh, this six-pitch overhanging uh, multi-pitch sport route in Mexico. Um, I fell, I whipped really big and my glasses flew off and they were at the base and I found them. Um, and yeah, basically ever since then, if I wear glasses when I climb, I wear uh, croquis or you know some kind of tether to keep them strapped to my, my big head. Okay, John, nightmare scenario. I'm soloing oh, yeah. El Cap, and one of the, I used to wear glasses, one of the lenses just simply fell out of my glasses. Yeah, that just sucks. I had prescription sunglasses, thank God. Lohan Easel asks, uh, best pitch in the valley? Do you I would... pitch or free pitch? Um, best pitch off the ground, I would say, is probably the Phoenix, um, 13A finger crack. And best pitch, multi-pitch, I would say, would be the Salathe Headwall. Oh, yeah. Top of El Cap. Um, 
what would be your answer? I've got I've got my Mark Hewitt on top ten aid pitches of my life, but <laughs> that's a little <laughs> bit different story. <laughs> okay, Noah West asked, uh, can you speak to nutrition? What do you guys eat? I'm assuming, Noah, that you mean uh, what do we eat on a multi-pitch route? I basically bring um, a mixture of... I'm not like a pro nutritionist here. Um, I basically just bring a mixture of, of bars and like some type of gummy, like the Cliff Shock Blocks or um, the, some kind of gels. Just, excuse me, just to get a little sugar. Um, although that's kind of more fast release. You know, climbing's pretty slow, like endurance sport in the multi-pitch world. Anyway, so things like peanut butter or more fat, you know, burns slowly over a long period of time. So that's, that's typically better. But, yeah, no, I mean, nothing crazy there, just a bunch of bars in my pocket. Um, yeah, same thing, bars on a multi-pitch route, I mean, what can you bring? We, uh, we bring the dehydrated food that you like. Um, you know, I'm not so high level that, uh -huh. I, that nutrition makes that much difference to me. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, you know, I've been on routes for 12 days, so I just, I mean, I have, I have sort of a good body. I can do, I can do well with pretty much anything. Um, Spits of Steel asks any suggestions from transitioning from transitioning from sport to trad when you don't have an experienced trad partner. Um, Spits, in my experience personally, I didn't have any experienced trad partners myself, so I cultivated my own. I tried to turn my sport climbing and bouldering friends into trad climbers and kind of just took the responsibility of of leading the way and yeah, trying to trying to you know make it happen myself even though it wasn't necessarily what they wanted to do so if you can't find somebody who's as excited about trad climbing as you are try and convince your buddies and make your own partners okay you guys may not know the answer to this brooke asks um because you're guys but how the hell do girls pee on the wall i don't understand i you've I, climbed a wall with I, girls, I climbed so. a wall with a with a don't with give two a women name. actually uh, and <laughs> I'm not mentioning names, so I guess this is okay. But the one lady said that she could simply project. Well, there you go. Uh, and as far as like pooping, well, you know, there's just you look that what way. What about the other lady? What did she do? Uh, we she didn't have to go on a portal edge, so that was it was easier. Okay, uh, Nick on lock asks tagline management at belays when you need two ropes. So we touched on this. So yeah, do this more in detail. We touched on this in the last one and. Um, tagline management, if there's a really nice ledge and it's easy to stack, um, I'll typically stack it at the ledge um, if I can. But if not, um, like, we, like I said in, my, in the last video, I'll just leave it hanging and manage the rope um, with a micro traction for the leader so they're not carrying the full length of the rope hanging down 60 or 70 or 80 meters. So, so um, Jordan started off, he... He gets to the anchor, we have that micro already attached, untie the knot, start pulling it down. Let that end go all excuse me, go all the way to the deck, all the way down. The bag comes up, dot the bag, untie the knot, keep threading until you get to the end. So now the whole line is just hanging down. Tie that back into the bag, and that becomes the next the end that, or no, don't tie it into the bag, but that becomes the end that the leader is going to take up. So the end is always sort of switching its way up the cliff. We never, yeah. we hardly ever, unless it's a ledge like Jordan said. That's kind of a hard one to visualize it, and it's, explain. Yeah, I still, but, have trouble. I still have more trouble. Um, and Dan Dan 57 asks, any tips for big wall speed climbing? And Dan, that's kind of, I'm sorry, that's kind of a really general question. I think any of the things we've mentioned today, you know, in a sense, contribute to yeah. big wall speed climbing. However, however you define that, so yeah. not exactly sure how much more to answer. Yeah, answer I mean, that question. I mean, yeah, really, people ask, okay, how do I prepare for big wall climbing? And really, all the big wall is is just, you know, if a big wall is thirty pitches that you do over four to five days, that's just five multi pitch climbs in a row. You've just got to be you know? really, really, really efficient with everything. So really to prepare for big wall climbing is get really good at single, you know, day multi-pitch routes from, from five to 10 pitches. Cause that's the most number of pitches you're going to do on a multi-day wall. 
And if you can do that five days in a row and add in all the logistics of sleeping and living on a wall, then you're, you're pretty much there, you know? Yeah. Okay, do you, uh, professional Gumby, uh, do you still use the rope as the anchor when building gear anchor? Yes, we talked about that already. Okay, but how many of you climb as a party of three? Okay, uh, have you ever climbed as a party of three and how would you manage that? So we were in Potrero Chico this winter and climbed um, El Sendero Luminoso with our friend Shane Lempe. Um, and basically Mark and I, um, we had three ropes total, a lead rope, a tag line, and then uh, a second um, a dynamic rope where we basically, Mark and I swapped leads the whole way, pretty much, um, you know, leading and then with the, hauling with the tag line. And then the second would uh, trail the second lead rope and we would uh, fix that at the anchor, fix meaning tie it off to the anchor with two knots. And Shane would uh, just micro traction behind us on his own micro tractioning setup. And, and sometimes so, if the if the pitch diagonal a little bit would send up his rope with the tag line or with the tag bag, and then as I would climb the pitch, I would clip Shane's rope into various quick draws just so that it created a little bit more of a directional. You can, and then and then that also allowed him to get off the anchor. You can probably find more of that on uh, more of that kind of thing on on the internet on how to how to climb with a party of three with the second with the third micro tractioning. The other way is to climb with two ropes and belay both of them at the same time. And that's full on guide mode and it kind of sucks and I don't like it, but I have done that. Okay, Louis Lewis um, asks, are you guys going to climb the new multi-pitch in Potrero, La Sombra Luminosa, when the quarantine is over? La Sombra Luminosa? Haven't even heard of it. But yeah, really? Um, we're really hoping we get to go back to Potrero yeah. this winter, yeah. Um, yeah. maybe in November. Yeah. So yeah, we'll check it out. Oh, whoops. Um, at hanging two bolt anchors, Henry Rollo asks, uh, how do you prefer to secure yourselves to the anchors during transitions to avoid being on top of each other? Um, we just clove hitch in with the rope and try and like, all right, I'm on this side, you're on that side. You know, or we have that sling dangling off to the side. Yeah. Um, so that's that. Uh, Julie Stumpy asks, what are your impressions of a climber living in Reno area? I think Reno is a great place to climb because it's oh, yeah. a good city. They have an airport, which is awesome um, if you have to travel frequently. Um, uh, it's close. I mean, they have a good gym now at Mesa Rim. Um, it's close to Donner Summit and Lake Tahoe. Bishop I lived, to I lived the in south. Reno Truckee for 10 years. Yeah. Way, yeah. I mean, we're in Tahoe right now. I lived in Reno for a couple years. It's a great place to be a rock climber. It's not too far from Yosemite. Um, Fletcher Miles, how do you manage hanging at a hanging belay without your legs going tingling and going to sleep? That's really just staying yeah. moving and yeah. shifting your weight. I try and pull myself up to stand on my feet, and I lift my legs, and I hit my legs to keep them. But, yeah, I do leave. The fewer hanging belays, the better, or the least amount of time spent at them, the better. Um, do you carry satellite phones in case things turn south in the backcountry? Uh, Wolf Chen asks. Um, yes, actually, after um, an accident in Mexico this this uh, this winter, um, I decided, and my friend was basically able to to save himself with the use of a. Uh, of a sat phone, I decided to to get a, a Garmin um, InReach Mini for for myself, and I'm really glad that I did. It's something I've been wanting to get for a long time. So, yes, highly recommended if you're doing anything in the backcountry. Um, when you need to repel, what do you take as a second line? So, maximum personal escape rope, seven millimeters, seventy meter. It's a uh, semi-static. It's really good. Um, favorite approach shoes. The Scarpa Geckos. Um, any interest in ice climbing or winter alpine stuff? Taggart Cole asks. You've actually done some, Mark. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I think I, we have about 10 minutes left, so yeah, thanks no, for I hanging with us. No, no interest. I don't like to be cold. I go to Baja for the winter. I haven't seen snow in years. Yeah, the only really reason I have any interest in ice climbing or winter alpine stuff is just to climb stuff in Patagonia. I don't want to go down to Patagonia and be, you know, only good at rock climbing because to climb some of those routes you have to be able to mix climb and ice climb and rock climb and all that. So 
I'd like to expand my skill set a little bit just for that reason, really. Favorite multi-pitch in the Sierra Nevada outside of Yosemite? Well, obviously, yeah, obviously that would be at the Hulk. I would probably say my favorite route there would be, I mean, positive vibration's amazing, but uh, if you're looking for something harder, definitely uh, uh, the Venturi effect is amazing. We um, we climbed like eight routes in the Hulk last winter or last summer. It was just so fabulous. Solar flare is awesome, yeah. and Airstream is one of the best alpine routes in the country. So, yeah, Carl Gregory says, "Keep up the training. Can't wait to see you back on the road." Neither can we. <laughs> yeah. We're pretty ready. Um, Here, move your knee. Can't move that. Okay, the sun is coming in through the garage door right now. Okay, Home Phrase asks, do you guys generally use your sling tethers for extending your rappel? Generally, yes. Um, well, no, we don't actually extend our rappel devices. Oh, no, 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 no. Most yeah, of the time, we're just rappelling on a grigri. Yeah. Um, so, n uh, no, we personally don't, but like, in certain situations, yeah, extending after, your rappel device after makes a lot of sense. we did the free rider, my ascent, we wrapped the whole route and cleaned all our gear, and so we're wrapping with haul bags and portal ledges and three of the ropes and all that. And so, yes, it's a really, really, really good idea to separate yourself from that dangling. But if I was just wrapping with my own body, I don't really see the need for it. Um, Alex Brayman asks, any slick moves going from aid to free? No, um, although... The, going the other way, uh, Genesis on El Cap. I, I yeah, I actually climbed real life 511B, uh, this traverse, and then this 510 plus run out, and then I placed a piece and I dangled there and I took off all my free climbing stuff and I hauled off all my aid gear and I led an actual real life A3 plus pitch. So that was <laughs> that was really fun. But going the other way, I guess it's, it's my just slick move. I mean, that's another kind yeah, of hard no question to answer. Moves, yeah. I would recommend is if you're d done aiding for the whole pitch, is just leave your aider on your last piece and step up on it and yeah. use it as a foothold yeah. and yeah. start free climbing. Okay, another cyclist asks, uh, "What's your least favorite off width?" Every, <laughs> All of them. Every <laughs> off width. <laughs> um, I actually yeah. like the well, monster. Well, let's say the, the let's truth. say the free rider. I actually like the monster. I, too. I, think, it, I don't um, think it's hard. I, I, I don't I particularly sort of enjoy the the Scotty Burt. I don't know. I don't know. It's yeah, pretty fun. Yeah, it's, Honestly, yeah. the last pitch of the free rider, or the second last pitch, has that a bit of thing. off width on it, and it yeah. kind of that kind of sucks. That might be my least favorite. Um, K C D C B A G asks, uh, what kind of shoes do you rock? Um, the Scarpa. Well, for multi pitch climbing, my go to are. Um, the Scarpa Maestro, um, low top, not high top, because they're not as stiff. Um, and the, the Scarpa um, Boostic are like my favorite shoe for, for hard, our granite face and crack climbing. So yeah, and Mark wears what your favorites are, the Vapor Lace from Scarpa and Yeah, what else? I did Sendero and the Vapor Lace, they were really nice. And you like the Maestro high top. Big yep. time too. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, Nico Morg asks, uh, any reasons you don't take one of the lockers from your hall system or ATC when you're rappelling instead of using two slings? Mm -hmm. um, no, so Nick. No the reason. main the main reason is if the length of my normal shoulder length sling was long enough, I, that would be a great idea. Because it's not, I just use um, um, you know extended a little bit longer with a quick draw. Now. When we are wrapping with the two, our two little slings set up, you know, two beaners unclipping, the chances are incredibly small. Yeah, if I was using just one, it right. would be different. That day we wrapped the whole Salafe with, with all the gear. We did have PASs and we did have beaners. If I'm depending on just one beaner, yeah, I'm a little bit more in tune with locking beaners. Um, Dev Bones asks, what makes you break out the visor? Whenever I want to look cool, <laughs> <laughs> the vi the visor is, is pretty sweet. Um, How'd you uh, learn eight? Kai Kaisarnowski. Well, what's the first name? It's an Instagram name. Oh, Kai. Um, Kai. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, how did you learn to eight climb? And I mean, really, the best way to learn how to eight climb is just to go do it. I mean, well, also to just have a decent amount of experience placing gear and tried climbing in general. But I, uh, my first aid climb was um, 
flight of Albatross with Steve Schneider, who very experienced Yosemite climber. That was his 120th ascent. He may have like the third most ascents of El Cap out of anybody. Um, and so he, you know, having him there to teach me was awesome. But honestly, I, I remember leading an A3 pitch which means A means that you normally would have to hammer, and I did it all on nuts, so it means I technically did it clean. So um, I don't really know how to aid climb like that much, per se. I mean, I just kind of figured it out on my own based on my experience trad climbing and seemed to work out well enough. So I really just know how to aid climb as much as I have to to climb things like nose in a day or whatever. But Mark and I might aid climb together more because I'd like to learn from him. Which has better waves, the washout or swamis? What do you think, Robert? <laughs> the washout is a surf break where I grew up in South Carolina uh -huh. and swamis is in San Diego and it's so much better. Uh, so Dave Oakton asked, Mark's top multi-pitch physical training tips for older guys. Um, us old guys, you cannot spend a lot of time on the couch. You just have to keep doing it. Um, you know, just keep doing those pull-ups, push-ups, just keep that body moving. Um, <laughs> you know, just don't stop. Just don't stop. I mean, I don't plan to stop until uh, until I die. Um, Cedar Wright asks, why does Mark look younger than you? <laughs> it's just... I'm, Cedar's know. just uh, afraid of me stealing his look with these sexy glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Nelly, what about sushi? We love sushi. We Nelly. should actually order some right now. We yeah. haven't eaten Come on sushi down. in a long time. Let's go. Uh, ben asks, if you have to bail on a route and leave gear, would you wrap on one bomber placement, or do you still want redundancy? I would probably still want redundancy just because, I don't know, seems worth it for not dying based on one piece, but depending on how bomber it was, I've definitely yeah. done that yeah. before. Yeah. Um, Nelly said... <laughs> Um, if you guys weren't climbing with each other, who would be your next choice? Oh, jeez. I don't have an answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I've had great partners, Max Jones, Shane Lempe, you know, uh, but everyone's in different parts of their lives. Yeah, I have, I have a few other people that I like, that I like, uh, to climb with. <laughs> Do um, you scream YOLO before going under bell? Yeah. <laughs> no, Cedar. Uh, my friend Jeremy and Joshua Tree, I really like to climb with. Uh, for ropes that do not have middle marks or the mark is worn off, what do you use to mark the middle point? Um, sometimes I just use a piece of tape um, at the end of a route when we're getting ready to belay or when we're getting ready to repel, but a uh, Sharpie's totally fine with Sharpie's me. Sharpie's totally fine. So. Who's older, Austin? <laughs> Look at this old guy. Yeah. We were just talking about this the other day. I'm actually closer to being three times his age than twice his age. Okay, we got two minutes left, so let's fire these off as fast as we can. Uh, does your partner start to look prettier after a few days on the wall? No. Nope. No, Mark looks uglier. <laughs> we both do, because it's just wall climbing gross. Um, Cedar asks, are you more of a single... Roper or back, I don't even know what he's saying. Would you dig? Would you grapple the big stuff? Cedar, I don't know come on, you're a writer. I don't even know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we didn't answer your questions yeah. fast enough, Cedar. Yeah. I don't know if you're still here. Uh, two or three piece gear anchors. Uh, almost always three, yeah, but go I with, mean, go with three. occasionally two when yeah. they're like super, yeah. super yeah. mega bomber. Mega bomber. All right. So Medium walls. Have you guys ever climbed in the gunks? Mark has. I have, I have not. Yeah. I grew up. Hampshire. I grew up all over the East Coast, and I haven't technically climbed anything outside there. And I'd really like to. So um, maybe one, do an East Coast road trip at some point. One minute here. Okay. First big wall experience in a nutshell. We kind of already talked about that. Yeah. Hooks. Uh, Mark, uh, how many A5 pitches have you climbed? I've free climbed a few. No, I haven't. <laughs> I, I, I've done three or four A4 plus, you know, which the aid system is totally screwed up, so. Um, where do you climb in San Diego to get ready for big Alpine stuff in the Sierras? Uh, Talk Eats is the best place, so. If you had to choose whether long, easy routes or less long, more physically challenging routes, I'd probably say, I don't know, long, easy routes Yeah. for the rest of my life, so. Yeah. 
Okay, guys, there's 10 seconds left. Thanks again for tuning in. There's two yep. hours of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll see what the response is like and think about doing it again in the future.